Hello, welcome to our midweek service as we continue with our journey through Paul's letter to the Philippians. I'm going to read today from chapter 1. I'm going to pick up a little bit of what I looked at last week. I'm going to read verses 12 to 26, but it's really the latter verses that I want to concentrate on. So let's turn to God's word in our reading for today. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defence of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage, so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labour for me. Yet, what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain. And I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word. Last week we looked at the first part of that passage about how Paul, who was writing this letter to the church in Philippi in a lockdown situation, where he was in captivity for two years awaiting his trial before Caesar. He'd appealed to Caesar and so had made the journey. It's covered in the last chapters of the book of Acts and was waiting to be presented to make his case to Caesar. And so he was in chains under a kind of house arrest in uh, Rome. And while he was there, Paul wanted to write to the churches that he wasn't physically able to be present with the church at Philippi being one of them. And so we have Paul's own witness from a lockdown situation. And last week we reflected on how Paul was able to see the restraints and the difficulties and the challenges of his situation as something that God was able to use and that was encouraging other people to preach and proclaim Jesus with boldness. And so Paul was able to rejoice in a situation of deprivation. I don't know how long it had taken Paul to reach that place, maybe from straight away. But I know from my experience, and I suspect from yours, that these past eight going on nine weeks of being in a lockdown situation under our own form of house arrest, it's a period of adjustment. And uh, we've had to adjust to all manner of things, the loss of company and friends and contacts, the loss of all of our usual rhythms, perhaps loneliness if you're on your own, perhaps frustration if you were just with the same people, perhaps boredom if you haven't got work to go to at the moment, perhaps anxiety about what this might look like afterwards. And so there's been a whole uh, journey that we've had to make psychologically, emotionally, spiritually, in this experience of being in a situation that we'd rather not be in. And so Paul, it seems, has come to some terms with this and is able to recognise that God is doing something which is going to work out for good. 
And we reflected last week on the fact that if Paul hadn't been in captivity, then these letters from captivity, which form a part of the New Testament and valuable scripture, would never have been written. And so we can't know the reach of what God is doing in this season. And we have in our own way to come to terms with it. And so he recognized that other people were being emboldened to preach the gospel. He recognized that some people were trying to stir up trouble for him as Paul was in captivity. There were people who were maybe by their preaching, uh, raising the ante against the Christian gospel, which would have repercussions. And Paul knew that. There were some people who were co-workers. There were other people perhaps seeking an opportunity to steal the limelight for themselves as preachers or maybe just maliciously trying to make life tougher for Paul. But Paul, by grace, was able to recognize that God could take and use it all. And some aspects of your circumstances and mine will do us good. Others will provoke us and perhaps challenge our attitudes and our reactions to other people. But even that, God can take and turn to good. He's sharpening us, uh, asking us what's in our hearts and our reactions, challenging us to see the good that he can do in us and in the lives of other people through it. Perhaps the phrase, I'm sure, hadn't been invented, but we've heard it said that there's no such thing as bad publicity. <laughs> And so that even from Paul's perspective, the fact that the gospel of Jesus was being talked about or discussed, that his captivity was something that was being reported, is a good thing. Even bad publicity, even those seeking to do him harm, uh, were nonetheless uh, ultimately shining a light on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I suppose the same is true today. Even those who hate the gospel who are uh, avowed atheists, who are opposed to Christianity and who uh, complain about it or criticize the gospel or the church or its message, make that message a focus of discussion. I heard today that the Christian apologist Ravi, Zich Ravi Zacharias died today, went home to be with Jesus after a lifetime of ministry, defending through his writings and his teachings, uh, defending the Christian gospel. And there are people who raise their voices against him, uh, modern atheists, secular humanists, who raise their voice against that defense of the gospel. But any time there's a discussion or an argument, it just brings it back onto the table. And so Paul was able to rejoice and recognize that God was at work, even through less than ideal circumstances. And that word rejoice appears a total of six times in the letter. And so Paul is clearly in a place where despite the hardship, he's come through to be able to rejoice, to rejoice in his circumstances, to rejoice in the gospel of Jesus, to rejoice that whatever is going on with him, Jesus is still in charge. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, begins this passage that we focus on today. And so Paul's rejoicing was based on two things that were going to help him. Let me read again. I will continue re to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. Two things then that Paul depended on, the prayers of other people, and as a result of that, the gift of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. In short, Paul knew that he couldn't do it on his own. He needed the support of the prayers of the churches in order to be and to maintain a good witness. And he knew that as people prayed for him, so the power of the Holy Spirit would fill and equip him to have the courage that he needed to have so that he wouldn't be ashamed of his standing in Jesus or, or his failing courage. And so he needed uh, to know that the Christians in Philippi and other places were praying for him. And he needed the power and help of the Holy Spirit so that he could have confidence that he'd be a faithful witness and wouldn't have any reason to be ashamed. And so I need, and you need, and we all need each other's prayers. Prayers that we continue to be a good witness. Prayers that we remain strong in adversity. Prayer that by the power of the Holy Spirit filling and renewing us, we don't lose heart or lose hope. We don't have any reason to be ashamed. 
And Paul wanted to be sure that Jesus would be seen in his life. And so there's an appeal from Paul to the church. And I appeal to you for your prayers, as I need to be faithful to pray for you, that together the Holy Spirit of God will equip us to continue to be faithful witnesses. And Paul knew that without the prayer of the, of the church and without the power of the Holy Spirit, he had the propensity for being ashamed. Paul knew that without those things, he could be ashamed of his uh, failure to stand for Jesus, perhaps. And Peter knew what it was to feel ashamed when he denied Jesus three times in the garden. And there's times when I feel and have felt ashamed at the ways in which I've let Jesus down by what I've done or said or failed to do. I suspect all of us at one time or another have felt ashamed because we've let Jesus down. And Paul knew that he could be just as easily uh, feel ashamed of taking a lesser stand without the prayer and the encouragement of other people. And so we need the Holy Spirit. Let that be your prayer for me and for yourself and for one another. Lord, give me the power and the fullness of your Holy Spirit so that I'm not going to be ashamed as a Christian, so that I'm not going to lack the courage that I need to stand up and be counted for Jesus. And so Paul uh, raged uh, or, or, or asked for the, the prayers and the courage of the, the prayers of the people and the courage of the Holy Spirit because he knew that there was a battle raging and there's a battle going on in your life and there was a battle going on in Paul's life and there's a battle going on in my life because Paul for Paul to be ashamed would be to take a lesser stand and for you and for me to be ashamed is to allow the battle to be won in the wrong direction what's the battle well, the battle is quite simply this. We can either let Jesus be exalted in our lives. We can either let Jesus be the focus of our lives. We can let Jesus be the one that our lives point to and are all about. Or the alternative is that we can allow ourselves to be exalted. My needs, my desires, my ease, my comfort, my pleasure. It's a simple, stark choice. Paul could have succumbed to uh, rebellion or to uh, self-pity, to discouragement. He could have got angry in his situation or, or lashed out. He could have allowed uh, pride of status and who he was and all sorts of other things. He could have focused on what he wanted or needed and become a surly, difficult character. But Paul continued to be a man of grace who witnessed to Jesus. And Paul had to reckon that he had to make that choice and keep making it every day. Is this day about Jesus or is this day about Paul? Is my life going to be about Jesus and what he needs or wants? Am I going to have my focus on him and because of him on other people and meeting their needs insofar as he helps me and shows me how to do that? Or am I just going to be all about me? The cross, as someone once pointed out to me, is an I crossed out. It's an I crossed out. And at the centre of our faith is a call for us to accept that our lives, our wants, our needs, our pleasures are, are crossed out. It's not that Jesus doesn't know what we need. It's not that he doesn't love us or care about the needs that we have. But he can only meet those in and for us when we first accept that it's about him and not us. Coming to the cross is accepting that Jesus laid down his life for my benefit. And the invitation of believing in Jesus is the invitation again today to take up our cross. What does it look like to allow the focus to be shifted away in my heart, in my mind, in my life, from meeting my needs, my desires, and turning instead and asking, Lord, what do you need or want of me today? That sounds like it's easy, but it's a battle. It's a battle every day because the old nature, the flesh, the way of our human nature is to put me first. But Paul recognised that by putting Jesus first, he found himself in a win-win situation. He said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. To live 
is Christ. So for Paul, on the one hand, that meant living his life, meant living his life for Jesus and not for Paul. And there's another sense in which he said to live is Christ means that real life, true life, life in all its fullness is actually only possible in and through Jesus. Because the reality is that you have experienced and I have experienced apart from Jesus, life is just an existence. Life will be full of frustrations and disappointments, things we want and don't get, things we hope for that don't materialize. For Paul, to live is Christ. To find life in the fullest way that it is and can be meant Jesus. And to die is gain. To die is gain. For Paul, to die physically meant that he would enter into resurrection life. To die physically would be to leave behind this world of its imperfections and enter into a world of perfection, of glory. For Paul, to die meant that he would be in the presence of God, in the place that Jesus had prepared for him. So from Paul's perspective, he recognized and understood that to live, to really live, meant to live in Jesus and that life could be found in Jesus and that while he was alive, he was all about Jesus. And that when the time came for him to be taken home, as Ravi Zacharias has been taken home today, then that's the sign that his work here is done and fulfilled and finished, and it's time to go home and time to inherit what will come next. Typically, of course, our natural instincts are to cling on to life as long as we have. It's all we know. Yet Paul knows that what we will be and become what lies ahead for us is better and far more worth pursuing than anything that this life has to offer. Of course, Paul's choice was he'd rather depart and be with the Lord. It, it seems and sounds like a kind of nihilistic, um, suicidal kind of choice. It's not in the least. It's not that Paul wanted his life to be over because he was in wretched misery. It was simply that Paul wanted the next bit that's coming. But he knew that until the time came, he would wait be faithful and labour for the Lord until such time as he got home. He knew that it wasn't going to advance the cause of Jesus or the needs of the churches that he was supporting and encouraging if he was going to be taken home early. He still had writing work to be done, which is what's left us a legacy in the New Testament. And so we know that uh, there's still work for Paul to be done. And until Jesus took him home, he was going to stay and do it. And so there'll come a time when we too will go home to be with the Lord, which is better by far. But for now, we remain. And so Paul allowed his perspective and his focus to be shaped, not by what he needed or wanted or preferred for himself. But he asked the question, what does Jesus need of me? What does Jesus want of me? So let me ask you that question as I've been wrestling with it too. Whose needs and wants are shaping your life? Whose priorities and perspective? Is it shaped by what you want, what you hope for, what you think you should have or get? Or instead, can you face afresh the call, the call of Jesus to lay down your life for him and to recognize that who he is and what he wants has to take prior uh, importance in your life? In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prayed in anguish because he faced just such a choice and came to the conclusion that not my will, but yours be done. And there's never a day goes by that we don't have to wrestle with that whole dilemma. Not my will, but yours be done. Maybe today won't hold what I hope or want or need or think I need for myself, what I think I should get, what I think I deserve. Per me, if I don't get it. But perhaps the day instead needs to have that focus that says, Lord, what do you want of me and from me today? How can I serve you today? How can I love you and love other people? Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured the cross. And Paul accepted that his priority was about serving the Lord and that his focus needed to be about rejoicing, finding joy in serving the needs of his brothers and sisters in Philippi. I've been reflecting on the fact that in this lockdown season, we've had an unusual opportunity and probably not always a healthy one either to focus on ourselves. 
without the discipline of having to go out to work or study, the have-tos of our normal existence, the lack of interaction and challenge from other people, having to think about other people or, or give consideration to them, listen to them, spend time with them, put other people's needs ahead of our own, I think it's probably been very easy for us to think of ourselves, to have all of these days and all of this time to focus on our needs and how we're feeling, uh, the things that we wish we could do. And we've only had to do the things that we want to do or can be bothered with. If you've not been working, maybe you've had all the time in the world to pursue what you want or don't want to do. It's been an easy time to allow the focus to shift onto ourselves. And Paul, despite his own lockdown and the opportunity that that might have included for him to focus on what was happening just to him, kept his focus on Jesus and on understanding how the situation and place he was in now might serve the gospel. So what does that look like for you? What does it look like for you to work through your thoughts and feelings? What does it look like for you to recognize that as a Christian, what does my circumstance mean for the gospel? And are there ways in which this time and the opportunity to think and focus on me need to be challenged again and to know that actually my life, my calling as a Christian is to be about Jesus and what he wants and that actually what he invites me to pitch my focus on is on his kingdom. It's not an easy battle. It's not an easy battle for me to live is Christ and to die is gain, to make it all about Jesus. And yet Paul writes this letter rejoicing, discovering that strange truth that when we yield our lives to Jesus, when we give up what we want to pursue or think we ought to have, when we take up our cross again and follow him, we find anew the joy of fellowship with him, the joy of his blessing and his provision, the joy of his peace as we rest our lives in him and stop wrestling and striving for what we want or think we ought to have and accept that he's got us in this place and he invites us to ask, and to ask ourselves, how can you give this place, this day, your life, today, back to me? Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the lessons of this difficult time and season. Lord, they're not always welcome. Where we've uh, seen or realised things about ourselves that have concerned us or alarmed us, we bring those to you. We ask for forgiveness where our focus has been subtly eroded and shifted and moved away to what we need or want ourselves. Lord, forgive us if we've become half-hearted or apathetic. Forgive us, Lord, where if we're not uh, about your business in the way that we hoped we would or should be. And Lord, we pray that you would take and use this season in our lives and in the life of your church to prepare us for what's coming next and to glorify your name. We pray, Lord, that the legacy of this time will be good and positive, and that the people who have perhaps re-engaged with the gospel, with church through online media, will continue, Lord, to persevere in coming to know you or returning to you if once they did. Lord, we want to be able to offer who we are in these days to you, but we pray that you, by your Holy Spirit, will come afresh upon us. We pray for one another, Lord, that you will give to us the courage so that we won't be or feel ashamed. And Lord, we thank you for the grace that meets us in our failure and our shortcoming. Because so often, Lord, it's in those places where we discover what we're not and what we can't do, that we understand fully in you the gospel of grace, which meets us in our brokenness and our shortcoming and points us to Jesus, who is all and everything. So Lord, help us as we offer ourselves. Help us to recommit ourselves to you. Help us to uh, shift our focus, Lord, and put it where it belongs, unto you who gave yourself for us. Hear us, Lord, as we pray. In the name of Jesus, we ask these things. Amen. Thank you for joining us again today for this midweek service. I hope all is well with you. Do get in touch uh, if there's any way. 
that you, we can support you, encourage you, or just have a chat. And it'd be good to hear from you. And if you'd like to do that, then you can put a message on the Facebook page or you can send an email to minister at sgt.church. In the meantime, God bless you. Thank you for joining. Bye-bye.